it is I, your humble host, Bill Hatch, the third, coming to you live from the Palatial Home Studio of the Bald Spots Productions here in the beautiful city of Santa Ana, California, for yet another episode of Not Quite After Midnight. Joining me, as per the usual in studio, is my friend, my brother in Christ, the disembodied voice of Rudy. Waka, 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 the Lord, I love you all. And joining us from more than acceptable safe social distances are my guests for this evening. From the East Coast of, uh, of the United States, we've got Kim Lang Langling. Try saying that three Hi times there. fast. Thanks for having me. <laughs> and joining us from the far <laughs> off uh, land of Malta is Andrea Christians. How are you doing, Andrea? Hello. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> Wow, that's uh So how many how many how many time zones are there right now then we're just in? the three. Well, yeah. Just three. Okay. Wonders of modern technology, eh? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Stretching from seven o'clock on uh on Thursday to four o'clock four AM on Friday. Just uh the amazing oh, oh. Uh, wonders of uh of modern telephony. So <laughs> Oh, I see Kim's Kim's got the coffee going. I got coffee going. So did I. <laughs> Meet the most. Cheers. Cheers to you. Cheers, sweetheart. Cheers. Oh goodness. So uh so how's everybody doing? Very good. I'm very, very good. I'm doing well. Yeah. That's doing good. Well. What's going what's going on over in Malta? Yes. Well, not because we don't actually celebrate Thanksgiving over here. So you know, I'm there in spirit, but we don't, it's sort of been a you know a normal day for us at the moment. You know, just on the rundown to end of summer. The the, the winter's just kicked in. Uh, winter, which is nothing really. It's just you know grey skies and it's not so warm. Uh, and we're on the rundown to Christmas really because we don't we don't have Thanksgiving, which I'm, I've always been rather sort of like bereft that we don't get to celebrate it. Well, we don't, you know. Mm. So so anyway, happy Thanksgiving to you both. Thank you. Oh, yes, filled with turkey and stuffing and, and uh, cranberry sauce. And... <laughs> way more food, way more food than a human needs is what we consume on Thanksgiving. Oh, yes, Day. absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I'll be doing a, I'll, I'll be doing a second Thanksgiving here in a couple days because uh, we got two turkeys. And uh, uh, I was trying out some new equipment, and uh, I got one of those uh, one of those uh, marinade injectors. It's like that. It's like that long. <laughs> so I stuffed it in my turkey and and marinated the meat from the inside out. Came out pretty good. And the turkey was happy. And the, the turkey was happy. I can imagine. <laughs> well, the turkey didn't complain. That's for sure. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> oh, so Andrea, you recently published a new uh, novel uh, called Suspension. Is that right? Yes, yes, I did in in June of this year. Oh. My, it was my debut novel, oh, okay. which is about time because I've been working as a, as a writer for many years. But uh, I wrote it my first novel. Got it published in June. It's called Suspension. Oh, great! That's awesome. How many? Uh, That's exciting. Yeah, it is. Uh, how many books do you have published? How many other works do you have published? Just out of curiosity. Well, I've actually worked. Um, this is my first book. I've just finished my second oh, okay. book. Literally, it's just days ago. Finished the manuscript on that. But I worked as a freelance features writer for like over twenty years. Oh, wow. So I've got like hundreds of magazine articles floating around the place. But this was actually my first book that I actually oh, okay. finished. Um, so I started a little bit late in life, really. Yeah. Um, but you know, they're better late than That's never. Right. And uh, and it seems to have unlocked the door or the floodgates. But now I'm just uh, writing. You know, I've got more ideas, more books sort of lined up. And um, I've just finished the second one, Happenstance, the first draft of that. You know, so um, it's exciting times for oh, me. That's awesome. Um... Did you? Uh, that is awesome. Yeah. Uh, did you get uh, help with editing and and all that good stuff? Or. Uh... Oh yes, yes. I'm, I'm with a, a publishing house, Lucy oh, House great. Publishing. They're based in Atlanta. Okay. 
and they've done they've done everything you know they've they've been amazingly supportive and um, right. put up with my nonsense you know as all writers are we're all a bit crazy and um, they've been great and uh, I have a very good close working relationship with them and so now we're we're getting together on the to finishing off I've, I've finished the first draft I'm just like putting a bit more meat on the bones of the of the first draft of, of, of happenstance which mm-hmm. is the sequel to suspension okay. And that's out. That's scheduled for release in October. We've just clarified that uh, now because we weren't sure when, but we decided that October next year is the best time to release it. So, right. um, yeah. So that's what's happening in my life right now. Okay. Awesome. Um, let's see, and then uh, and then Kim. Um, uh, let's see. Um, no sharing nuggets of hope. What uh, uh, what have you been working <laughs> yeah, on, like, right? What's Kim, <laughs> What's Kim doing? What's Kim doing? What's Kim not doing? Kim's an author, podcaster, and top TV show host, and uh, and a veteran. <laughs> Two. How can you find the time? <laughs> I like to keep busy. I like to keep busy. Well, busy's That's, good. Yeah, I keep I keep busy. I I just I just uh, just published a, a new anthology called When Hope Found Me. Okay. And. That was literally the ebook was literally released today. Nice. So that went, yeah, that's kind of exciting. Yay. Yeah. So, and uh, the pre order sales, it, they, they were going cool because I was like, holy cow, we were sitting at number two for quite a while. Nice. And I was, that was exciting. You know, before it was Excellent. even released on pre order, it was at number two on Amazon. Now, you know, to a lot of people that might not be a big deal nope. but to me it was that's massive. yeah that's a big yeah. deal you know, yeah. like we're at number two this is exciting wow. so um and it just went <laughs> live today the ebook, and then the print book should hopefully go live within a week so Great. and um there's also going to be a large print edition so i'm excited uh-huh. about that too because there there's there's a need for that mm-hmm. i have found and doing some more research on it after it had been mentioned asked I was asked do you have large print books I went no I hadn't thought of it and they said well you might want to think about that because a lot of the folks that read the stories that are in anthologies Mm -hmm. are older and I went you know that's a good thought so I did some research and so moving forward when I do anthologies like these I'm going to be publishing large print editions as cool. well. So both of those prints, the regular print and then large print edition, they will be released at the same time. So that's kind of exciting yeah. too. And that should be in about a week. Nice. Well, that's uh, yeah. that's great that you could uh, come on and share it with us today. Yeah, that was perfect timing, yes. wasn't it? <laughs> Very timely. Yeah, excellent. I hadn't really yeah. thought of the large print but actually what you're saying makes a lot of sense because older people generally don't tend to like the 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 ebooks or the the or the kindles and no. these things. they're more comfortable holding the book even me i'm i'm like that so you know obviously there's always that oh have i got to put my you know my strongest glasses on or so if you've got the larger print that's that's much more mm-hmm. sort of user friendly isn't it you know it's a great idea yeah actually. and it's for people people i it, it's all there's all kinds of stuff from the blind association mm-hmm. the american blind association that i was reading about because I was fascinated by it. And I'm like, well, I want to learn more about this because you're putting books out there for the readers. Right. Yeah. It's not yeah. It's not to boost my ego <laughs> or somebody else's ego. And I'm not in it looking at dollar signs first. I'm in it looking at it as these stories can positively impact somebody. And yes. if it does that, then yeehaw, yeah. you know, that that is such a big yeah. win. So I'm like, you know, large print, I started looking into it, people that older folks, people, um, you know, eyesight Mm -hmm. issues, or people that literally, like you were saying, I have to constantly put my reader, my cheaters on in order to read anything. But if I had a large print book in front of me, I wouldn't have to. (laughs) So I thought it was, I was excited. That's a great idea. I'm going to tell my publisher. It's a great idea. You know? Yeah, Yeah, for sure. Seriously. Now it makes your book, it makes your book a lot thicker. (laughs) mention it it's a great idea there's a lot more pages in your book my uh my my grandmother my father's mother um she had uh macular degeneration and uh she fell in love with her kindle and uh figured out how to we taught her how to enlarge the print so 
she could make it bigger and bigger as she got more and more blind and uh and then we figured out how yep. to uh how to make it read to her so <laughs> oh awesome yeah, even better yeah, yeah. So there's the auto reader yeah yeah and, yeah. and the audiobook and the, so many things audiobooks are really popular now as well apparently yeah. um that's what i heard you know so they're all mediums to explore I've never, so, have you have you yeah. ever listened to an audiobook have you ever sat and no to an my son does when he goes jogging he, and he does but i've never actually listened to one they were suggesting that i, I do my own book onto audio but i've it's just not got I've not got because I actually voice um documentaries and stuff as part part of my part of my job. I'm an MX ray radio broadcaster. Mm. And I used to do a lot of like documentaries and on television commercials. So they said, Well, you can voice your own book. And I thought, hang on a second, that's a big undertaking, you know? So <laughs> it is a big undertaking. Uh, it is a big undertaking. And so yeah. um I'm just concentrating on the writing at I'm at the moment, you know, I've got a, a deadline which uh I want to make and then and as you know Kim I've got another book in the pipeline as well which uh, is called which I haven't mentioned to you Bill uh -huh. because um, I haven't really got around to it but I've got a book called Chemo Club okay. um, which which as the name suggests is, is about cancer mm -hmm. because I'm a two times cancer survivor wow. and uh, it's not a memoir it's not a memoir it's a collective story of okay. characters based on real people that I met on my journey to recovery okay. the most incredible heroes and I'm talking about people, not just the patients, but the doctors, the nurses, mm -hmm. the family members. Um, so I've got this book, which is uh, my third book, which will hopefully be finished in 2023 20, as well. So yes. that's why when we, you, I, when you, I found out that Kim was coming on, well, we've already had this conversation, haven't we? So <laughs> um, but I feel it's an important book. And I've been told mm -hmm. it's an important book by people. Because when I started to look out there, there were a lot of memoirs written. Yeah and i mean memoirs are great you know but sometimes it, you can get a slightly different take on something when you bring in like a, a you know a lot of characters that that's so why uh, being a writer and kim, i'm sure kim identifies with this we're like sponges and we tend to pick up on, on events and things that happen to us that happen to friends so mine is like a collective experience of of, of um, experiences that I had I'm actually in the book but I'm also there for experiences of friends fellow cancer sufferers mm -hmm. um, and what they went through and so uh, I've got that going on as well so I, I'm really impressed with the idea of the um, the large print though that's 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 resonating it's, you know? yeah, no really yeah I would grab onto that and definitely talk to your publisher yeah yeah because yeah. a lot of people with illnesses and stuff mm -hmm. have a hard time seeing it affects you know yeah yeah. all kinds of stuff i mean you know, my I, chemotherapy and... affected my hearing sorry i'm sorry i didn't interrupt you uh but not my sight i was lucky mm -hmm. but you know people get you know damaged eyesight and all sorts of yeah things my my course. friend leah as her uh as her cancers progressed uh um she uh she her sight got worse um it was it was also related to uh uh to uh retinopathy diabetic retinopathy um the cancer oh, the okay. chemos had had changed her diabetes and really just pumped it into overdrive and uh and it, it caused mm. the retinopathy and yeah it was just uh it was awful um for her but uh, yeah a lot of a lot of people uh, who undergo cancer treatments um lose uh, at least part of their sight yeah yeah and my my yeah. sister is is uh well she's been through two bouts of cancer now since we talked uh Faye, she um we she went through her second bout so Goodness. we're bounced she's oh. bouncing back from that now oh. and just had some additional testing done so we're really really hoping a third round isn't coming yeah. but right. um yeah your book is is needed out there so keep I on think, you know, we're, we're, your heart. yeah i'm definitely i'm halfway through it just i was told i had to prioritize you know because they needed the sequel i wanted to write the sequel it was while i still had the I, the characters were still in my mind they're like they're like friends, you know, staying, yeah. sort of yeah. staying in my house. And I didn't want to get that distance between them and I'd have to get to know them again. So I just carried on, you know, really. And uh, I've been very lucky, actually. It, it was quite a, a free flowing story. And uh, and I had a lot of free time, you know, because I was recovering. Mm -hmm. and, and so I've used that time productively. And so I feel like I've, I've achieved something, you know. So but I'm, I'm biting at the bit to get to get to finish Chemo Club because I really feel it's such an important book because as you know kim there's so many people out there that have this illness and and when you get a diagnosis like this you're free falling mm -hmm. 
you know you're mm. grasping at anything that that can bring you comfort and and, and everybody thinks that when you get a cancer diagnosis that the, that the people around you are going to behave well well they don't right. you know my partner at the time left me mm. Uh, when I got my cancer diagnosis and he couldn't deal with it. And when I actually talked to my surgeon and he, and I came in one day to see him and he said, Andrea, where, where's, where, where is he? And I just said, well, he's left me. And they were like, and he just said, I'm so sorry. But he said, would you, would you believe how often this happens? That couples break up because one of the other can't, the, the mainly the couple who's the supporting partner can't deal with it. And, and something like one in six women are left by their partners when they have breast wow. cancer. And I was one of that, I was part of that statistic, you know. So um, so my book actually um, sort of focuses on human relationships and also unexpected friendships that people can be very strong and and and, and have, come from nowhere and give you support. And then other people fail you. But I think maybe that's the same in, in many situations when you're, you're facing trauma. I don't know, Kim, perhaps you could add more to that. No, no, I agree. Um, the dynamics in human relationships are amazing, aren't they? <laughs> I've, I've reached a point in my life, uh, literally just it's, you know, you're, you're hitting seasons or if people are just, they come into your life for a reason. And if they leave, it, it was, they were meant to leave as well. Um, mm -hmm. as hard as, it, as hard as it might be to, to let certain people go or, or maybe you personally have to shrink your own circle to keep you mentally healthy and happy and maintain because sometimes i'm sure with you going through um cancer and treatments and all of that sometimes it probably took all you had just to maintain during a day you know just to maintain it did. It did, and uh yeah. and, you know and it, we've, i've got my i've got my own issues and i'm watching my sister who uh, you know i just love dearly go through this journey and it just it tears you apart but I'm trying to be that super supportive person because I can see her doing her damnedest to maintain. And it yeah. takes a lot of strength, takes a lot of strength to maintain through this journey. Yeah. And yeah. it takes a lot of strength from those that are around you in your circle. And those that are the strong ones and the supportive ones and the caring ones and the loving ones. Those are the ones that'll stick to you. They're gonna stick with you. The ones that leave, they weren't meant to your stay. tribe they are your tribe isn't it you really find out who your tribe is when you go through something like right. that you know and, and sometimes it isn't necessarily family it can be like you said friends i mean a, a close friend what who was a close friend now but she wasn't that close came through and now we've got you know the most incredible bond because i she was unexpected something i didn't know that well and i was just there so stoic you know mm. um would you agree also that people have different ways of a, of dealing with it i mean just to give you an example, when I got my diagnosis, I spent my days crying, like, why me? Then being angry. And then um, I sort of went into denial and I danced all the way through chemotherapy. And I'm not joking. I literally carried on dancing. I lost my hair, went to dance classes, ended up going five nights a week. And it kept me going. And even when, on the days when I was tired, it was why, my way of dealing with the illness. But what then I had later, which the psychiatrist it warned me would happen, I had like a, a form of PTSD. It literally hit me after. It was like I came up for breath at the end of it all when I suddenly realized I was going to live and, I, and whatever. Um, and then it hit me. And then I had this most terrible depression, which I was like, well, I almost had like survivor's guilt, which was totally unexpected. And, and I didn't know, not many people talk about it, you know, with, with regard to cancer. They think you just get through it, you get through it. But then what comes after, you know? And, and for me, that's been a lot to deal with. And I think would that tie in with with what you're saying about you know your the book that you've written, it's it's sort of you know human emotions are, yeah. are so complicated, and so they unexpected. Are. And there's so so many people are going through so many big things right now, you know. Mm. So many people are going through so much, and oftentimes you just want to ignore it because it makes you uncomfortable. Yeah. You know, yeah. and that's just being honest. There are times you don't, it's like, well, no, I don't want to talk to that person. And they're going to bring me down. Oh, they're going through so much, but you know, I don't really know them that well, you know, and you get that. And that's why this year, this, the word hope. And I think you and I talked about this when, when we chatted a few months ago, that's been my word for the whole year because it shows up 
in front of me constantly. So the name of my book is When Hope Found Me. I'm working on my own Brilliant solo book. I'm working on my own solo book called um, Nuggets of Hope. And that's just going to be, it's not an anthology, it'll just be me. Um, but then I went and bought, I got a bunch of these little <laughs> stones that, that say hope. And they're my little hope nuggets. And I literally hand them out to people when I'm out and about. And it's always strangers. And it's always when I get this strong nudge, mm -hmm. I'll feel it. It's like I get this vibe thing going. And I'll be like, oh, that person needs a nugget of hope. And I've been yeah. giving these out for probably close to six months now. And the reactions are always amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's even brought me to tears at times. I'll get into my car and just sit there and start bawling. <laughs> yeah. Because you don't know. You don't know what someone's going through. When we walk out our back door to run errands or go to work or whatever, we're putting on a mask. We're putting on a mask. We just do. Mm -hmm. So when you meet someone and they're having a crappy day or they're cranky or just, you know, whatever, you can just tell they're not having a good day or they're tossing their negativity at you. Yeah. Instead of getting angry, like a lot of folks do, sit there and take a breath, take a step back and think, I have no idea what is going on in their life right now. No idea. They could be going through something huge. Mm. So this quick story, real fast, I want to share. I'm not, I don't want to take up the whole time here. There, they, I gave out a nugget of hope the other day to an older gentleman. He was in his probably mid to late 80s. And I saw him in the store. And it, it was just a stranger. I don't know the guy. I walked up and I said, excuse me, sir. I'd like to give you a nugget of hope. And I hold out my hand. He holds out his hand. He looks down and he goes, hope for what? And I went. And I took a breath. Just went, well, sir, hope for whatever it is that you need at this time. And I just smiled at him. And he goes, what I need right now is to find this dish soap washing, dish dishwashing soap. And he was like, really cranky. Not a happy person. <laughs> and I'm smiling. And I said, well, let me help you. Well, we couldn't find the type he's looking for. And he got frustrated more and started walking away, you know, just turned and starts pushing his cart away and uh i said well sir i wish you a blessed day just kind of tossed it and he turned and he turned back and looked at me he's like thank you <laughs> and i'm like well but but he has that nugget of hope in his pocket yeah. yeah so who's to say that when he got home he didn't pull that out and i thought remember the kind lady in the supermarket yeah and that and probably would have given him some because comfort. maybe he was taking yeah. care of a, his his wife maybe she has alzheimer's maybe she has dementia maybe he's her only full-time caregiver and he is just ridiculously yeah. tired and he just needed to find the dish soap you know maybe he's having one of the, maybe he's sick himself yeah. and he yeah. just he was it was taking all he had just to get through the darn grocery store to do his errands because he just wants to get home and lay down we don't know. Yeah. We don't know what yeah. people are going through, you know. So just be kind. That's what I've been telling people. Just be kind. Darn it. Or I'll punch you in the yeah, nose. It's so easy. It's so <laughs> That's right. Just be kind. <laughs> it's so easy to say, but then somebody, and yet sometimes it can be so hard to put into practice because you just get lost in 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 things, don't you? You lost in your problems, lost in your, you know, with things that you think are important, and and, and I remember that. When I got the news, and I was really totally unexpected, you know, I was fit, I was dancing, I was slim, I, you know, and I, and I wasn't expecting to get this breast cancer diagnosis. Um, and I, and I, first of all, I was annoyed, but then the second I thought, all the things, the petty small things that I was worried about, I remember that this phrase kept resonating in my mind, you know, it was like, don't sweat the small stuff. Mm -hmm. And all the nonsense just didn't matter, you know? And, um, and as you said, it's, it's kindness. And that's what I found, you know, when going through my situation was was that kindness is is perhaps the most sort of retaining emotion that that holds us fast in difficult times you know um i, I like, mean i like how you worded that children. i like how you worded that retaining emotion yeah kindness is, is. retaining emotion yeah well yeah. wouldn't you say that you know. that whatever the thing is that a person's struggling with is it seems big to them 
it may not seem big to you you know but uh, uh but it may you know what you know like the uh the gentleman uh in the grocery store finding that soap was the big thing at that moment right and yes. uh and that was that was traumatizing to him and he may have gotten home and it was you know and there there was something there was uh whatever else it was the the real thing staring him in the face that uh you know was right. his sick uh his sick spouse or uh or looking in the mirror and realizing that he's 80. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I, what you, you, just just don't know. you know, you know, we can't really appreciate yeah. that. You know, we're not, neither none of us here is 80, but you think about it when you get to that age, what, what is there mm -hmm. really to look forward to? So how do you hold on to hope? It, it, you know, their take on hope is probably a completely different thing to yeah. what ours is because they're approaching the end of their lives, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, um, yeah, one of my uh, yeah, I'm cool. My mom. One of my day jobs is uh, I do I sell uh, final expense insurance, and so I deal with a lot of people uh -oh. who are who have uh, the end of their lives on their minds, and uh, um, I was going through a list and uh, and found uh, what was it like seven or eight people out of a list of forty who uh, were eighty plus, and uh, and it's just it's. Yeah, it's, I mean, that's, it's that inevitability, you know, that like you get up to 80 and it's like, you know, there's, there are fewer days ahead of you than there are behind. And, uh, um, you know, and, and that's, that's difficult for people to, uh, to deal with. Right. Yeah. My mother well, has you... turned age. <laughs> Sorry, Kim, carry on. Carry on. Oh, okay. My mother just turned uh, 80 um like two, like two weeks ago and i have noticed that as she was approaching that birthday and since then she's talking more and more about things um how her life could have been mm -hmm. if and she's not one that she's not one whole life and i'm in my 50s she's not a person who shared a lot of stuff and now she's beginning to. And I see that you can kind of see like a shift, a mental shift mm -hmm. happening. As she, you know, she's like, yeah. I'm 80. And my grandmother, her mother died at oh, wow. 80. So that's got my, in, in my mom's head too. And I think she's become much more, she's reflecting more. She's reflecting a lot more and sharing more with us yeah kids and we're all in our 50s now and she's just now starting to share things with <laughs> us, you know? um, but it's it's interesting yeah because you know like you said it, it and you hit you know 80 you, you're in the winter season of your life you know so you would you would look at different things and you, you would be hoping for something different it might just be can i just get through today feeling halfway decent you know, you you think that you know. uh, you'd think that uh, with the whole winter season of your life thing, that uh, that you'd have a Thanksgiving and a Christmas to look forward to. <laughs> but I guess it's always winter and never Christmas. But uh... <laughs> might be, yeah. Well, you I know, also I... believe the important that the quality of your life mm -hmm. is important. You know, I mean, um, I. I mean, if you haven't got, if you're ill, you're in pain and, and, and whatever, they're not, there's no quality of life. But, you know, there are people, my mother's 88 and she's um, she's got some serious health issues at the moment with her mm -hmm. legs and things. And we literally thought a few weeks ago, we possibly might be going to go and lose her. But she's rallied and she's come back and she's this laughing and joking yeah. and vibrant woman who I, never ceases to amaze me, you know. But again, you know, and, and, and really quite funny. And I'm like, you know, she's found this strength to, to just, just become so philosophical mm. about life. You know, I mean, there's one thing we're all certain about is that we're all going to die. And to do, as I said to you before, Kim, I'm not scared personally of dying. I'm scared of not living. Mm. You know, it's a cliche, but it really sort of. There's a reason it's a cliche. And so it's trying to live your best. <laughs> yeah. Right. There, there, there is. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, you yeah. try to live your best life, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, for example, let me just give you a little example. This is funny. Um, I've got my little apartment here in Malta. And I, I mean, because I live alone, me and the dog. It's just like, I, I, I thought, this Christmas, should I, should I decorate it? Shall I bother? 
And then I think, oh, maybe next year I'll do it. Or when my situation changes, I'll do it. But then I thought, you know what? This isn't a rehearsal. So who knows? This time next year, I may not be well. And I probably will be, but, you know, you don't know. So I thought, no. So I went out and I bought loads of Christmas decorations. (laughs) And I'm making it. And I'm on sort of in the process at the moment. It's it's Victor's Grotto. This is something I haven't done since my children were little, you know. But I just feel it's not a rehearsal anymore. And and even though... um, I'm, I'm in my 50s like you are Kim you know when you get an illness like this you can't really make plans you'd like to think you're going to make 80 but there's a fairly good chance that I won't so there is today and there's now and so what mm-hmm. happens in its own way an illness a serious illness it can be cancer it can be anything else if you look at it the right way you can actually become a gift and, it, and that's what it's done for me it's changed my outlook and it's made me live for today. And when people people used to say that, oh, live for today, da, da, da. I didn't quite understand it, but now I do. And um, and my my you know my life isn't perfect. My situation's not perfect, but I'm trying to live my best life mm-hmm. with what I've got and with what I've been given. I, I don't always manage to stay so positive. <laughs> there are days where I don't yeah. feel like that, but on, you know, I'm, it's sort of. Uh, a, a mindset which is becoming stronger and stronger and, and bearing me up even when you get bad days and things like that. And, and, and I think that, you know, perhaps older people, perhaps a lot of them have learned that, you know, they, they're at mm-hmm. the end of their, their time. I mean, I do believe that we're here, that our purpose in life is to learn. We're meant to learn. You know, I, 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 that's why an 80 year old will have a completely different opinion to, to a 20 year old because they've gone through experiences of life. The twenty-year-old, the twenty-year-old is, is still uh, indestructible. <laughs> yeah, right. he's going to live yeah. forever. You know, he's going to live forever. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah. and I've even reflected that. You know, when I wrote suspension, I mean, um, I was recovering, and um, I literally, I think I told you the story. Came that basically, what happened was that I got a deal, and I hadn't finished the book, and I was like. So I had to knock out this book, really finish it off really, really fast, you know, and um, and but a lot of it reflects my own spiritual beliefs as well on on sort of like not not necessarily that I'm God Mm -hmm. per se, but that there is something, you know, and and, um, just trying to so that in a way suspension became a a sort of um, an extension, if you like, of what was going on in my mind at the time. And then I took it into make it into a, a supernatural paranormal story. But the, 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 the sort of basics of it, the bones of it are my, my spirituality, my belief in the universe, as opposed to, to God as, as in the conventional sense, you know. Um, and that buoyed me up and kept me going. So, I mean, we've all had our, our struggles, I think, haven't we? You know, I know that, you know, Kim, you've written about yours and, and you know, it, 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 these struggles, they shape us, they make us who we are. Yes, they absolutely do. <laughs> they absolutely do. And I know, like what we were saying earlier, when you reach a certain point, there's so many things that that used to matter or bother you or whatever, and they just don't anymore. Because no. you, you realize what truly is important. And like you said, you're living your best. Each day, you're living the best that you can in that day. You're living your best life for that day. And if we yes. could do that all, all the time, wouldn't I think the world would be a totally different place? Well, what we've what we've you talked know? we've talked about before. I, I've talked about before uh, the the royal we, I guess, um, on uh, on this show and other shows um, is uh, living life for today as though today is going to be the last opportunity you have, but making plans as though you're going to live a long time. Um, you know that that the combination gives you both your 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 day your uh, your excitement your your living life to the fullest for today, but uh, um, but not giving up on the possibility of. I mean, I hate I, I don't want to say live for living forever, but you know, for living to your eighties, nineties, uh, triple digits, what uh, whatever uh, have you. My uh, my grandmother uh, um, lived in Shell. She was. Uh, 93 and change and uh, um, and had her mind up until uh, up until the end and was as stubborn as a mule and <laughs> and, uh, and all that stuff uh, but she uh, she 
she was all about planning for tomorrow. And uh, um, and I think that's part of what made her live so long was that she she'd have plans three, six, 12 months out in advance and and uh, uh, for uh, for things that she was going to do. It's like, I still want to do things in, in this life. And she went out and did them. And, uh, um, you know, I think, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, My grandmother did the same thing. She would have, she'd go, well, in three months I'm doing this, and in six months, because she was a snowbird, so she'd go down to Florida, <laughs> you know, in the summer, and then eventually, um, her and my grandfather, when they were both retired, they moved down there full time, but she would come up here in the summertime. So she had all this stuff planned, mm -hmm. you know, um, in advance, and she always did. And when she passed away, she had woke up, went and played not nine holes of golf. She was an <laughs> avid golfer and went and bought herself a brand new car. Cause she was one of those people that always bought a brand new Lincoln town car every two years. Okay. That was just, that was what she did. <laughs> And she had just went and got herself a new car, played nine holes of golf, came home, ate some lunch, laid down and took a nap and just didn't wake up. Wow. That would be the like, way. You know go. what? That's a fantastic yes, that's last exactly. day. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. A shock for the family left behind, but what a way to go, isn't it? <laughs> right. Well, she had, you know, she even, when my mom and her brother went down to clean out the house and have an auction and, you know, all that stuff you have to do with the house that's out of state. Mm -hmm. Um, in her spare bedroom, she had her suitcase out and half packed because she was coming up here to Pennsylvania. Yeah. You know, that's her, the, because there was going to be a wedding, you know, her one, one of her granddaughters, my cousin, they were, she was going to be getting married. So she had, and then she had a list of things that she needed to pack, still needed to pack yet. I mean, she had it all organized. So she was, you know, she always had something to look forward mm -hmm. to and to plan for. And I think that makes a big difference too, because she was a widow mm -hmm. by that time and all of her friends had passed away. Yeah. And she yeah. would get really depressed because I'd call her every Sunday and she would get really depressed. And she's like, you know, she goes, I don't even know why I'm still sticking around here because all my friends are gone and her husband had passed away years before. Mm -hmm. And she's like, I don't even have anybody to talk to. It's hard to find anybody even to play golf with anymore. And she would get, and I could understand, yes, that would be incredibly depressing. Mm -hmm. And now my mom is noticing that. Mm -hmm. She's like, you know, my mother my too. Mother away. too, same thing. Yeah. You know? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's got to yeah. be hard. That's going to be hard too. And that's something we don't think about because we're not there yet. Nope. It's but, you know, that. that would be hard. You know, when uh, it's starting to yeah. get there because I, I just hit 50 in September myself. Um, and, uh, mm -hmm. um, Welcome to the club. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, the the half the century. <laughs> but uh, um, but I've started noticing um, celebrities that I grew up uh, with are starting to die. <clears throat> you know the the few the few outliers and you know it's like I got uh, I watch the on YouTube I watch the Legacy dot com uh, weekly videos of which celebrities died. And this last week it was the Green Power Ranger. <laughs> yeah yeah the, the the original green power ranger who i remember uh i remember watching those shows back in the 90s <laughs> yes i was a little yeah. old for watching those he's but old. uh but yeah and it's it's like yeah, he's, he's not old <laughs> my son used to watch them <laughs> oh okay yeah oh dear yeah it's it's a, it's a fact of life yeah. isn't it people you know they yeah, but it's weird yeah. it's weird when you start experiencing mm -hmm. it because you hear your grandparents talk about it your parents talk about it and then all of a sudden because i said to my mom the other day i went i'm gonna be 55 i go i remember mom when you were 55 and i thought you were old <laughs> and she just started laughing and i went and now it's me yeah. <laughs> I'm i know gonna, i know it's it's a kind of a it's a weird mental feeling you know, you, you really, it and was also, for me, uh, you got to work at it. You've got to, cause I don't, I don't feel 55 mm -hmm. and I certainly don't act 55 at certain times. You know? Yeah. Well, I, I, I totally get that. I mean, you know, I'm just turned 58 and I'm like, I'm two years off 60. I can't believe it. You know, 
and, and in my mind, I'm sort of still 28. It's only when I look in the mirror, I think, good God, what happened? You know, to me. Who is this person? And I have every intention. Of who is, the, who is this person and how did they get in my apartment? And yeah. <laughs> but I have to be honest, my children say, Mum, when are you planning to grow up? And I say, well, hopefully never, because I have no intention. Right. You know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a young soul and I'm, I'm staying that way. My kids are more mature than I am, you know. But I do believe that uh, this is something I found is quite refreshing. You know, they have these things you can see, you know, celebrities, what they really look like if they didn't have the plastic surgery mm -hmm. and all. And there's such this obsession with you. So when Madonna, I mean, I know we shouldn't have mentioned it, but what in the earth? You can she have doing? it. She was a beautiful woman. <laughs> I don't know, ridiculous now. But I mean, Renee Zellweger, you know, the actress, she she recently commented that she's 54 and that she's embracing her age because, and I and that's what I started to do when I read that. And then sort of, and, and, and um, Sarah Jessica mm. Parker is not sort of, you know, dyeing her hair and stuff. There is a, there is a, a everybody tries to be the best they can, especially as women, we're, we're put under sort of a certain amount of pressure. But there is a, there is a dignity of, of growing older yeah. as well, you know? And uh, and I I mean I mean and like I said I'm 58. I don't think I look bad for my age, but I'm not I'm not 28, and I'm not trying to be 28. You know, and it's, it must be perhaps it's different for men. That Bill, I don't know. But perhaps you don't feel that pressure. Um, I don't know. Yeah. But you know, as women, we are we categorized by our age. Oh, you know, she's old enough. She's, she's invisible. You know, it's a bit like that. You're right. You're absolutely right. You hit a certain age, and you be you start. To, I've noticed. Yes, you start to become invisible. Mm. Women, females do. Um, I just decided a long time ago, poop on it. I'm, I'm, I am the age that I am. That, there's nothing I can do to change it. And no amount of plastic surgery or dyeing my hair or, or what Botox in my lips, whatever it is people do, because I don't do any of it, um, obviously. <laughs> but I have no desire for that because I'm not here to compete mm -hmm. with anyone. Yeah. You know, I don't need to look like someone else because I've, I've been in my 20s and 30s. I had that prime time of my life, you know, and now I hope to think that, you know, the, the looks and not that I'm saying I'm like this raving beauty because I know I'm not, but I never I've never been one that's like focused on it. Like I have to look a certain way. Um, and now I, I really could care less. I mean, it's like. Yeah. I think you know, you know, I'm 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 my age. I think there's nothing. Mm -hmm. I think there's nothing more attractive, male or female, to find somebody that's comfortable mm. in their own skin. You know, you know, and I sometimes, and, and you do occasionally meet people like that, and and I just think it's so attractive, and it doesn't, and you don't see the physical, you see mm. the person, and that's what I'm striving right. to. Because we're all we're all a work in progress, aren't we, to the day we die? And I mean, I certainly I certainly know I am. I'm trying to learn and improve and whatever. And that's something that I I realised. I thought, no, I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to get. You know, yeah, I got a couple of wrinkles here and sagging skin there. What the hell? You know what I mean? I've lived my life, and uh, and I and I'm lucky to be here because there there are a lot of people that were with me in that drug treatment room who are not there, who are not around anymore. I haven't had the privilege of the last yeah. three or four years, you know. So. Um, it's a celebration of being alive, isn't it? And and I do believe that we are meant to learn. That's mm -hmm. why we're here. And that's what I've reflected to some extent in, in my writings as well. Um, to bring it back to the book, is, is, is the fact that, uh, you know, we are here as, as, as a sort of, like the soul is meant to mm -hmm. evolve, I believe. And that's why the person I am now, the person you are now, the person you are now, Bill, will be different to the person you were as a teenager because like you that. have the lessons to learn and sometimes they've been painful lessons yeah. but they're lessons nonetheless oh yeah for sure you know yeah and you know so with all the wrinkles and the gray hair I, the way i look at it is wear them proudly because you earned them that means you lived exactly uh, I, oh, I, I shave, shave off the grays <laughs> <laughs> no that's not true i've i've just i i've been keeping a, a slight beard and you can definitely see the grays there so oh i have well look at me i i my hair is starting to streak gray down my sides yeah look it's really yeah. attractive though yeah that's just attractive. how it started growing I, it goes right down the sides and i'm like well i'm just gonna people ask me aren't you gonna um aren't you gonna 
start dyeing your hair and I'm like why and why do you care what my hair color looks like you know exactly. why would I want to why would I want well to we're the ones who hair? have to look at it <laughs> you know my little my little hope nuggets I, instead of you know handing one I can there you go nugget too. <laughs> yeah, that he said we're the ones that have to look at it embracing it and i'm like you know yeah i've got crow's feet and wrinkles starting around my mouth and the whole neck thing going on you know and you look in the mirror and you're like oh wow yeah let's go get some more coffee (laughs) 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 it's funny you know i mean and i mean i've got my little routines like every morning i've got my little dog my my writer's companion and i live near a forest it's a quite young forest. It's not. A, it's a man-planted forest, but it's it's sort of like man-made. It's probably about thirty years old. But it's, it's and so we walk into this forest every every day, you know. And it's uh, and, it, and it's commune with nature, you know. It just gives me this this tremendous feeling of like peace and tranquility. And it's literally, I step out of my front door and I'm there from Malta, which is this concrete jungle. I'm lucky to live in this particular location, which is the, re- the reason I live here is because I wanted these woods. And just just being around nature, hearing the wind through the trees, and and just yesterday, because I was really grumpy, I went for a walk. I knew I had a day of writing ahead of me, and I got a parking oh, no. ticket because where I live, I got a parking ticket well because I couldn't park the car the night before, so I parked on double yellows. And some little weasley little traffic wards had come up at about eight o'clock in the morning and booked me. So I was walking around in the trees with the dog, and I was really annoyed. And then, but the time I came back from the walk, I was like, do you know what? It's just a parking. No big deal. And it completely chilled me out, you know? Yeah. So I try to do that every morning. I have this thing, this little like this, this little regime that I do every morning is to get up, have my coffee, take the dog for a walk. And I didn't I mean I'm lucky at the moment that I can do that. I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to continue to do that because I'm probably gonna to have to get myself a job, but uh, a day job, because unfortunately writing, as most people know, you know, the, the life of the impoverished yep. writer. Well, you know, that's it's a reality. It's very hard to make right. a living as a writer. And so uh I'm definitely going to have to sort of get myself some work, doing probably some other writing work, go back to freelancing and stuff. But I'm lucky to have that privilege at the moment to be able to go out in the morning and um, and do that and spend mm-hmm. time in nature. And, I, and it really does soothe the soul. Yeah. You know, for me, it works. I do the same thing every single it's day, different. two times a day. I have to. Yes, I have to. to that's how I maintain. Yeah. I have to. So I, where, where are you actually I living? Outside. You live in the countryside, I think, don't you, Kim? Yes, in Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. And are you? Is it a country location where you are? Yeah, I'm surrounded by fields and woods. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. So I can sit on my back deck and I watch the deer come in every night, and we just my dog Dexter and I every morning grab my coffee. That's the first thing. That's how the day starts. Grab the coffee and we head out for at least a half hour mm-hmm. walking in the morning. Yeah, and then, then again, yeah, yeah. Well, one of the things, uh, yeah, Bill, one of the things I've uh, I've done before, and uh, and it's certainly appropriate for uh, for what day today is for uh, for those of us here in the states, um, is uh, write a gratitude list. Um, you know, ten write down ten things I'm thankful for, and. uh, um, you know they're they're often the same thing as they were the day before but uh but still there's their things and uh um you know it, it really changes the uh the way uh, a day looks when you uh when you start off being thankful for things right yeah so you uh-huh. do 10 a day you write the are they okay? So I was I was doing this. I was doing that with someone just on a day we mm-hmm. were chit chatting, and she, we were talking about what we're grateful for. And she goes, well, "Let's just come up with five things right away." And you know, to me, it wasn't the big things. That came, I was like, you know what? I'm thankful for my electricity. I'm thankful mm-hmm. for my dog. I'm thankful that I'm able to walk with my dog every day. And it, it was all this stuff that that was not like materialistic. Right. And it was interesting to see that right off the top of my head, the first five things I thought of were things like that. And then, you know, they were asking me, well, what about your car and your house? And I'm like, 
Well, yeah, but those weren't the first things, you know, I'm thankful, right. of course, I'm thankful for that. Um, yeah. But my car, yeah, I, I like my car. It's a newer car. I'm thankful that I was able to afford yeah. to get it. But if I didn't have that one, I would still have some other kind. You know, it was just, it was very interesting conversation mm -hmm. and how it rolled, but then how the first five things that popped in my head were you know, being able to take walks and stuff like that. It had nothing to right. do with like job right. money. It, it wasn't stuff. It was. Which I found, I found interesting and refreshing. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it wasn't stuff. Yeah. 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 A lot of times uh, it's <laughs> yeah. friends and family <laughs> and, and the dogs and, and sometimes it's the cat, but not often. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes for me, I, it might be, yeah, I might have a day where it's just like, I'm thankful and grateful for coffee. And that's it. <laughs> that might be it for the day. <laughs> you know, um, I've got to tell you this. I, I, I work for, for, you know, I told you I'm a freelance writer. And, and one of the things I write, I don't know how I got into this, but I just did. I write interior design. And um, I, I guess in Malta, we have some uh, pretty amazing properties. I mean, they're running into the millions because it's it's an unusual uh, cosmopolitan island there's a lot of foreign investment here so we get to, i get to go in with the photographers into some of these amazing properties worth like five to six million some of them some of them some of them more or whatever apartments often you know in these like really beautiful locations but you know i could say i could talk generically here with no names mentioned mm -hmm. but some of the people we meet you know they've got so much money and they have live in these amazing properties but they're not yeah. happy you can just see it it's just like you. I, I think. Oh, if, I, if I had this property, I'd you know. I think, but you could just see they have the same problems. Oh, I remember one particular property I did. I mean, it was it was one of the most expensive I've ever done. It even had its own gambling wow. room, and it was the most miserable guy I've ever met in my life. He just had nothing to smile. He's a multi multi millionaire, and he was just so miserable. And I just thought to myself, you see, so money does not buy you happiness. It doesn't. And that was to me. It's always it, that was a good ten years ago. I met this person, and I had that experience, and uh, and it stayed with me. That you know, I, it's just to have enough. And what and what my idea of enough and your idea of enough is is perhaps very different to somebody who wants that yacht and that and this and yeah. that and that you know right. whatever, you know. Right. Um, I mean, if somebody said to me, "What's the most important thing apart from my health?" Obviously, being well. And loving my children and everything is my personal freedom. Um, and I'm, I'm lucky that my life at the moment allows me allows me that that I don't have to go and sit in a, a job that I, I particularly dislike. I mean, if I do take on work, I tend to take on writing commissions anyway. Um, and I, I, it gives me that freedom that if I want to, I can burn the midnight oil and work till two o'clock in the morning to reach a deadline. But then I can take yeah. the day off. Are you like that kid? I don't know. I'm, uh, I like yeah. that flexibility, you know. I think that's part of the creative sort of psyche as well. That creative people tend to. We I struggle with routine. I have to be <laughs> honest. I don't know if you're like that. I don't like things to be too regimented and and and, and re repetitive. I like things. I mean, we have to have structure, but um, I like the fact that I can like spend an entire day and I can do like twelve hours writing and then perhaps I won't write at all the next day. I, but I know that I'm well within my deadline, you know, mm -hmm. and so, um, um, and I've always been like that. And whenever I found myself in situations where I've had to sort of work at regular nine to five, I've been, even when I worked in radio, I, I used to be what was called a swing jock. And I loved it. I used, to work, I used to work across two radio stations and there were all different styles of presenting. You'd be doing interviews, you'd be doing hot FM. You know, there was just a totally different style. And I loved it. When I went then to do my chat show, I was bored. Because it was the same, even though the guests were interesting, it was the same format, mm -hmm. you know? And I, I miss yeah. that the stimulation of the constant change. Um, but I don't know, are you like <laughs> that? Do you, do you identify with that? I don't know, I know Bill has I, a day job. Bill's, Bill's got a couple day jobs. <laughs> oh, good for Bill. Yeah, you know, I, I am. Um, I do find that in, in my situation has just been like that for the last three years. Um, Cause I, I always worked out of the home, you know, I was, I was in sales and marketing for 25 plus years. And, uh, but it's just, you know, when, well, actually it's when COVID hit. 
So yeah, just about three years. I have found though that I struggled at first to get myself in a good routine because at first I was like, what am I going to do? You know, I've never not had a full-time job. So I was in a weird spot mentally. Um, but then I was like, oh, this is an opportunity. You know, this isn't a door that just slammed in my face. This is an opportunity. So now that I've, you know, it took me a little bit to find my little groove. But like you said, you'll sit there and write all day, one day. And then the next day you're like, okay, I'm still within my deadline. I don't, I can, I can relax and do something else. That freedom part of it, I am finding that I'm starting to be able to let myself do more because I'm one that's like, if I'm not working, cause I'm, I'm like a worker bee. I always have to be busy. Always. I have a hard time relaxing. So I have to almost say that you will work. You will do all of this stuff and all of this stuff. You're going to have all the stuff done for your clients and all your own writing done. Then you're going to, you're going to get it all done today so you can relax tomorrow. And then like the relaxing day comes and I'm like, you know, it's, it's, I have a hard time relaxing. I really do. And I, I have to work at it. I have to make myself do it. Even if it's just like, I made myself go to the movie theater and see a movie by myself. I've never done that before ever. And I was like, uh, and I actually got nervous, like almost anxious about it. And I'm like, no, you're going to go there and you're going to enjoy it. <laughs> It's not cheap to do something like that. Yeah, we're out of your comfort zone, weren't you? I I stepped way out of my comfort zone. Mm. And so, but I went and I did it. I enjoyed it tremendously. And I'm driving home. I'm like, look at you. (laughs) You Mm. You relaxed. You actually relaxed today. So for me, that's, you know, it's my, that's baby steps for me. Because I I do have a tough time relaxing. I have to always stay busy. Always. So, yeah. Yeah. Any tips on yeah. any tips on relaxing? <laughs> Come on, Bill. Give us some tips. Come on, Bill. Oh, stop with the coffee. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is it. The coffee's That's, keeping me going. Got another it's five past five. Morning. I just said to you, I was, I was debating, should I go to bed and, and sort of wake, stay awake or wake up early? And I went for the wake up early, you know? So I uh, actually feel fine. So. <laughs> So, because we're in, like I said, three different time zones mm-hmm. at the moment, aren't we? So, yes, we are. You know. Which is kind of, kind of makes it fun, too. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's different. Different, different, different points of view. So, what happens the day after? What happens the day after Thanksgiving? Shopping! Because I, I don't really know much about it. Black Friday. Black Friday. Um, it's, uh, yeah, we, we go, okay. Americans go shopping on the day after Thanksgiving. It's usually when uh, okay, we get Black Friday. Yeah, sale. everything goes on sale. Everything's on sale. It's insane. Yeah. It's not just shopping. There, there are people doing it right now. In fact, there, oh, yeah. there are people. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Some places started on uh, on uh, on Thanksgiving evening, and. Uh, yeah, it's it can be crazy. Um, we're we're talking people getting fights and and uh, this is this shot combat shopping. <laughs> yeah, it's like a it's yeah it's full body combat. Like that. Combat it's crazy. Shopping. No, people stand in mm-hmm. line for hours for the store doors <laughs> to open because this this the sales are the sales are actually really good. Yeah. High, and that's when people usually buy like their high end stuff, like their electronics mm-hmm. and their TVs and their computers yeah. and all that, because you could get them really, really, really discounted on Black Friday. Yeah. Or then comes Monday, which is now Cyber, Cyber Monday, Monday. And that's <laughs> so that's all online shopping. Same thing. Everything's discounted. Yeah. The Cyber Monday is not as much full contact. Um... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amazing. We get we, we have um we have Boxing Day, which is Saint San Stefano, which is the twenty sixth of uh of uh you know the day after Christmas. Mm-hmm. And in Britain right. we have to, um they call it Boxing Day. They don't they don't do it in Malta, and that is the day when everybody goes to the sales. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean we do get Black Friday. I think it must be an American thing that's come in because we we do get that as well. 
But I was curious because I said for us Thanksgiving does not exist. Right. You know, we don't we don't celebrate it. So I'm always curious, uh, you know. So I understand you do the, the, the turkey and, the, and and all the trimmings and everything, but it was what happens the day after. So now you've answered my question because I've always wondered, you know. <laughs> so it's combat shopping. I like that. <laughs> it's combat shopping and and decorating for Christmas. Yeah. That's pretty much what Americans do. They the day after Thanksgiving is the beginning of the Christmas holiday. Bam. Well, I don't know about I don't know about where where you are, but uh, our Christmas uh, music started uh, like uh, November first. Um, oh, it started in October. Oh, yeah. Christmas is winning. <laughs> I I saw Christmas decorations going up here about the first week of November. Store. Yeah, well, we get we get stores that do it, but or earlier than that. But uh, uh, but we have a. a uh, an FM uh, radio station out here that does 24/7 Christmas music starting November 1st, and because uh, they can't quite get over yeah. the Halloween hump, <laughs> Halloween is stopping, is yeah. keeping Christmas from taking over the rest of the calendar, and. Uh... <laughs> well, you know, I was in a store the other day, well, a couple weeks ago. It wasn't yet Halloween. But there was Halloween, mm -hmm. Thanksgiving, and Christmas decorations already wow. out. All three of the holidays. Yeah. I'm like, it's not even Halloween yet. But it had all three of the decoration yeah. stuff out already. And I was like, oh, come on. You're really, really pushing it now. Can we just enjoy one holiday nope. at a time? No. Nope. Got to come earlier and earlier each and every year. <sighs> but it's more and more commercial, isn't it? <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> it's yes. more and more commercial, isn't it? You know, just trying to sort of yes. get people to, to spend and, and, you know, buy things they perhaps don't need or, or creating d demand or need where right. there isn't, you know? Right. Which uh, I remember the first year I went to live in Sicily because I think I explained that I tried to, I, I'm at Malta, it's right next to the island mm -hmm. of Sicily, which is the southernmost, it's the largest island in the Mediterranean. It's just off the boot. Yeah. You know, it's Sicily space like a boot, shaped like a boot. Well, it's just off the south of the, of the, of the foot of it were, of the boot of, of Italy. And I, I sort of live try to live between the two islands. But when you go to Sicily, they maybe it's because there isn't so much money floating around, but their Christmas is much more traditional, mm -hmm. especially in the villages. And you don't have this mass shopping, this hysteria. Yeah. It's like, you know, um they have a big wood a log fire which burns the entire Christmas period outside the church. People they do the mulled wine and things like that. And they have the Father Christmas that goes through the village. But it's actually very refreshing because it's not right. commercialized. It's very family orientated. Yeah. And the first time I I was there the first year, this is like 15 years ago, I was like, well, where's all the Christmas rush? And there wasn't any. And I, I just actually thought it was so refreshing, yeah. you know, to, to experience that. Um, now, is, I and, think but that, then there's more to I think it might be a European thing because in Germany it was the same one way in the small villages. Yeah, you know, they had well, there's, there's not, first of all, there's not a lot of money. You know, they don't have the, the, the money in the small villages a lot because a lot these these villages, in, especially in Italy, a lot of them are dying because the population are elderly. The young people move away. They move to yeah. the cities for jobs and things, or they move up north, especially because southern Italy is very depressed economically, um, and so they don't have uh, the money to spend. But there's something so lovely and wholesome about the way they celebrate Christmas over there. Because like yeah. you say, you don't have all this hype and all this mania about having to buy, you know, it's sort of, uh, uh, I often hang up and go, this year I'll do Christmas up in Sicily, but then I never managed to do it because there's all other reasons and so, sort of, you know, but it's a different take on Christmas, a traditional take on Christmas. I was gonna say I, it's the way Christmas yeah. used to be. Yeah, yeah. And I think I it should no. still be, but <laughs> who am I? Yeah, yeah. No, no kidding. I mean, Malta's a place, Malta's a Catholic country, which, is, which you know, considers its fake religious, as is Sicily. Mm. So the church and the, and the religious festival itself, you know, the, the mass and everything, is, and they do the live cribs with the animals, which is lovely. You know, most most villages will have those where you have, you know, your the statues. Sometimes you have real people, you have the real animals. You don't have the real baby, obviously, but, you know, um, uh, and they they really sort of make a it's a, it's an important thing to them that they do that that the the Christian the Christian aspect of it is very important, 
and it, like I said, it's very wholesome. It's very, it's, it's very comforting, you know. So, yeah. whereas then you turn on the television. I mean, I don't watch much TV, but you turn on the TV and you're inundated with television yeah. commercials. And uh, sometimes I just think we've lost the plot, you know, <laughs> with it all. So, you know, it's just like yeah, bye bye. No, bye, I bye. agree. We've lost the plot. That's a good way to put it. We've lost the plot. You know. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, the funny old world. Eh? Sometimes we talk about progress, and I wonder if it is really. I mean, I remember the Christmases of my childhood, and, and probably you know you, you two remember mm -hmm. as well. And there wasn't this. Yes, there was the, you know, the, the Christmas rush to do the shopping and stuff, but it was the, the one day, the one afternoon, and it was done. Yeah. You know, and uh, now it's just like weeks of it, and it's yeah. Every week, every year, I think, right, I'm not going to get caught out this year. And every year I get caught out. <laughs> I'm to do that Christmas shop. In fact, I've stopped cooking, cooking Christmas lunch at home. I put, I don't put myself through that anymore. It's when we go out. It's just easier, you know? Yeah. But Thanksgiving, I think, is traditionally done at home, is it? Uh, with you? In, at in somebody's home, yeah. Yes. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. And is it, is it family? Well, is it primarily family or their friends? Um, well, we just... Uh, Today it was just uh, me and uh, my roommate Rudy, so uh, we didn't have anybody else okay. over. But uh, it meant I got to cook a smaller bird. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that's good. <laughs> Bird's happy, <laughs> and he got marinated. He got marinated. Yep. <laughs> that's so his marinating gun. Injected. <laughs> got injected with something. <laughs> that's funny. Oh dear. And then of course then there's New Year. Because then New Year's especially for the Scots, my goodness, the New Year is such a big yeah. thing. Again though, it's just, you know, so commercial, it's so expensive and everything, you know. So my idea of a perfect New Year's Eve, I've always said, would be to have a beautiful dinner party. Everybody dress up, you know, mm -hmm. and sort of like uh, you know, in like a very salubrious sort of I don't know, like um uh dining room with like a red velvet dress and candelabras and Probably a couple of weeks to serving, you know, it's a bit old worldy, you know. So that's to me, that's New Year's Eve. It's something, but it, again, it's never like that. But that would be my perfect New Year's Eve. I'd have a, I'd have a dinner, a dinner party with my nearest and dearest, and lots of wine, lots of lovely food, yeah. you know. And uh, that. so, yeah, that, that's what yeah. Is my dreams. What I have to do before my time, time is up on this earth, I think, you know. I can't do it in that's my right, place, yeah. it's too small anyway, but you know. A bit old worldy, a bit old English, like you know. Yeah, in, in that sort of would very, be, very that proper. Would be, yes, pinkies yeah. out and all of that. <laughs> oh, totally. Yes, yeah. The, 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 like I just see the red velvet dress and I see the candelabras and oh yeah, I could love all that. <laughs> love to do that, you know. Just, just for New Year's Eve, I just think it's something, you know. But instead, you go out and, and people are just falling about drunk because yeah. <laughs> they've all come down yeah. out of the pubs. So you know. <laughs> Oh, I haven't anyway. went out for New Year's in years. It's it's yeah. I, I find it too dangerous actually. It's it's a well, young person sport. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about full contact. Yeah, I, I also feel that uh, <laughs> right. the drink driving thing in Malta. You know, with technically we have a drink driving laws, but they're not very um, mm. forceful. They're enforced, and so New Year's Eve can be quite dangerous. I mean, now the taxis are that we have a profusion of taxis now, and and and, and that makes things a lot better, but. Um, yeah, New Year's Eve used to be terrifying. You know, you'd be going out and there'd be people that would in, in their cars, and you'd be thinking, and you could see the guy in front of you is like across the road, like this, like you know. Um, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing this year yet. I haven't really got that far. My my uh, social calendar is it, it's busy enough. I can't complain, but I'm just not sure where it's going to take me yet. You know, so because my son actually works for the uh, the Red Cross, oh. you know, which is the, the ambulance mm -hmm. service. So he's on call over the Christmas period now. So we're, we're trying to sort of organize Christmas, but he's like, well, I don't actually know that. I might be working, mum, because I, I, I can't give my staff any time off. So I, I can't not, so, you know, give, not give them time off and not be at work myself. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I don't know exactly now. But anyway, things will be, it'll be good either way. I'm not complaining. I'm glad to, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> you know, yeah, glad well, right. to have the problem. That's what I decided. Yeah. I won't. Yeah. I just said it's stress. Holidays have, I've noticed, can be very stressful for mm -hmm. families and people oh. because everybody has such high expectations all the time. Um, and it, my family and I, you know, all of us together, like for Christmas, it's like 
none of the kids are little anymore, you know, so that magic of it is not yeah. so prevalent. So we don't go out and buy all these gifts for everybody. We either make stuff for each other or, or we just don't give anything to each other. Yeah. And, you know, it's yeah. because that's not what the day's about is, is who can the nicest gift or yeah. as many, you know, who, who got more gifts than this person or was that oh, gift yeah. nicer than this one, you know, stuff like that, trying to one up each other and all that. So we, for probably like the last four or five years, a lot of times we just, we have like a, we'll bake stuff and we have a bake tray. You, you know, one year we all made a bunch of cookies and we all traded cookies with each other. So you came with the cookies that you, and you went home with cookies that other people made. So you got a whole bunch of different kinds. So we, we've been trying to come up with different things and I don't have a big family here. So there's, you know, there's only like six of us. Um, yeah. So we come up with different ideas like that. So it's not, we're not stressing each other out and the kids are all grown. They're all in their twenties and thirties mm -hmm. now. And you know, they're, they're, they're off on their own or in college or in the military and they're deployed somewhere. So we're kind of scattered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you yeah. know they make they make time for you. Like, don't why they? do we put you into stress on ourselves? Let's just <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's why why put stress on yourself? Just get with exactly. each other, have a nice meal, mm -hmm. and relax. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't like That's I don't I mean. like being forced to give a gift mm -hmm. if I'm not inspired to give it. You know, it's like I like I agree. I like going through my life and. You know, it's like seeing, oh, wow, that thing would be great for Joel. I bet you he'd love to get that. And just some random thing, you know, or, uh, or oh, hey, Rudy would really get a, a kick out of that. Thank you. Know, you. And give, and give yeah. a gift. It's that thoughtful. Yeah, have another. Yeah. Right. I get you. Yeah. Yeah, it's that pressure. Yeah. You're right. That's the right word, that pressure to give a gift. I never liked that. Yeah. Or if you had gift exchanges, I'm like, why do I have to, why do I have to pull a name out of a gift exchange? I don't know this person. <laughs> yeah. And I have to go spend well, managed, 25, I have to spend $25 my, uh, on someone I don't know, or I might I not even know. like. <laughs> yeah. I've done, and I don't do that now. I just, I just buy for my immediate. And, and I already know, I've been told what my son wants for Christmas anyway. He wants a cafetiere, you know, one of these things with a coffee. So I think, okay, oh, yeah. we're moving into your new place. That's what you're going to get. So I'm, I'm very happy to buy him something that he wants. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, so and it's it's something he wants, and so you know, I probably am going to treat myself to a, a Kindle. I think if my Kindle died, oh okay, and um, yeah, it sort of died to death. So it wasn't now, overused. See, I just left now, it. if you were if you were in America, now is the time to buy a Kindle because they're really cheap for Black Friday. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll have to have a look. But you, have have to to, get but you have to be on Amazon.com. Yeah, I can I can get what well, we got Amazon.co.uk, which is the same thing. Yeah. We have the Black Friday. Well, I, I don't the, I don't think it's all the same. <laughs> well, it's Amazon, you know, but it's just things are different. Go ahead and check it out. I don't know. I don't know oh, if they'd have Black Friday yeah. sales on the UK. We ones. do get Black Friday. We get flat. We get we get it on the, the uh, British Amazon or the German Amazon as well. Yeah. They have oh, them, okay. you know, because we're in Europe, so you know. So everybody shop anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not a I'm not a great online shopper to be honest. Like I still haven't got my head around that, even though I know it's the way forward. Um the only thing I do love to buy online are books. Mm. That's why I thought if I get myself a Kindle, because in Malta, because we're in the sort of you know the southern tip of the Mediterranean, mm. I mean if you want a book, you've got to order it. You're looking at two weeks, you know. So um it's oh. just if I get a Kindle, it's instant. But, yeah. You know, yeah. So so I think my Kindle just died a death. I didn't actually charge it and the battery went. So if I get myself a new one now, that would be my Christmas present to myself. Because I don't, I don't know about you, but I don't watch much TV. You know, I'm, I'm sort of like no. a, I'm a reader. I might I watch the occasional like um, documentary or something, but I've got more valuable things to do in my time. Than, and, and I've recently discovered podcasts <laughs> because I hadn't realized just how great they are. They can be great. You know? <laughs> So how, how what led you to start your to start your podcast, Bill? What what's the story behind well, it? Well, I had started out uh, back in 2011 doing uh, doing radio, 
Uh, I was on a uh, oh, okay. I was on a local uh, radio station doing a show, and uh, called Your Wonderful Life. We were on the sports uh, local sports network, and uh, um, and we did interviews and and all sorts of things. And and uh, when that show ended, I thought, you know what, this was so much fun. I bet you I could do it online. And so, uh, so I started it and uh, started doing that and kind of expanded and grew and became what it is today. My, my podcasting oh, okay. empire. <laughs> <laughs> podcasting is huge though, isn't it? Yeah, I didn't yeah realize. It, it can be. Because actually, yeah, it is. Yeah, a friend of mine was saying to me, because I'm obviously a 20 year broadcaster, 20 mm -hmm. years ago, I was in radio in the UK. And, uh, he said to me, why don't you do a podcast? And I was like, well, I hadn't really thought about it. But actually, it's got me thinking now. Perhaps I should. Yeah. Because there's so many amazing people out there to 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 interview, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I would oh, like to write. Is. I probably would do more like, yeah. I mean, I, I think mine would be more geared towards like writer, the writer's angst. Mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 the sort of living the writer's life, you know, which is sort of like, um, but that, that brings in also so many interesting people, like people that should have a book written about them, but haven't, you know? <laughs> Um, we do encounter these people, especially older people. They tell you their life story. You think, crikey, that's a yeah. book to write. So I, I keep thinking maybe it's on my to-do list. It's just I'm a bit I'm intimidated by the technical side of it. I'm a bit lazy, but I have to look into it. You can, you can do it. I started one after Googling and researching for two hours. <laughs> oh, really? That's when I, because yeah. I had lost my job and I'm like, what am I going to do? So I started yeah. a podcast, but you know, um, and now I'm at like 157 episodes. Nice. It's just fun. Yes, you know? I know you. And, and that led into the television show, which is the right stuff. Which is it's all about authors. It's I only have authors on there, so it kind of it snowballs into stuff. But I find it fun. I I love doing it. But I was gonna I I didn't realize this. I don't know why it just hit me. But all three of us have radio background. Yeah. yeah. I found that is, it just hit me because I, I was like, oh, that's right. You were, Bill was in radio. I, I've been doing it for 10 or 11 years. And you were, weren't you in BBC radio as well, Andrea? Yeah. I did some work with the BBC. I did mostly with them. I did, um, I worked mostly in commercial radio. Um, and I had my own show six days a week, which was the last show. I, well, I did everything. I did breakfast, drive, everything, all different styles. Yeah. Because I worked for like, I worked for about seven radio stations. Um, but then the last show I did was a, like a chat show, and uh, but the BBC, we what I did with them was actually affiliated documentaries, and I was just voicing mm -hmm. the documentaries, um, because to work for the BBC you've got to be of a particular ilk. You've got to be, and I, I, I was too, I was too, too free spirited. Mm -hmm. I feel to to work in the BBC, you know. Yeah. Um, but I enjoyed it. It was a short stint, but mostly my background is commercial radio. And uh, but you know the industry has changed so much now. You know mechanization mm -hmm. um, was the death of the local radio station. I mean the radio station I started in just literally finished last year, and it was eight years. It was fifty years old. It was the oldest radio station oh, yeah. in the UK. And what they've done now is they've taken everything up to to Manchester, which is a city about three hundred miles away, and there's no local identity. Mm -hmm. And, and it's just really yeah sad. we got a lot of you know it's really they, they don't use they don't use DJs anymore they don't use people yeah. it's all no no it's all scheduled and timed the the radio station here in my local area they are one of the few that still has a morning afternoon and evening host they're phasing them out but they're still hanging in there because yeah. but in between certain hours Everything is just scheduled and automated. Both the music, the yeah. and all yeah. of that. We've got a we've got a pretty Please. decent yeah. local yeah. station yeah. here. It's a it's a rock and roll uh, music station, but uh, um, yeah, they've got a morning a morning crew and the uh, and a, and a lunchtime DJ and then the afternoon and the evening DJs. And uh, um, I mean, they're they're pretty restricted as far as uh, as far as what they can and can't do. But um, but it's still but they're still trying. They're still holding on. <laughs> yeah yeah well that's long made that yeah. it's a it's a dying it's a dying yeah. breed it's definitely a dying yeah. i mean breed. you know i remember that when i used to work in radio in the station i was at because i stopped my last show in radio was on the 
19th of March 2005 because I moved to Sicily and I gave up my career. I had I said I was on six shows a week, full time contract. And I remember my boss calling me in. He said, "You sure?" I said, "I'm sure." It was time. I wanted to. I moved to. I bought this ranch in Sicily, and I and I changed my life and and uh, run this horse riding centre, which I did for many years. And then my relationship went into natural the destiny, and sort of. And then I came back to writing in Malta. But I remember that you know, um, sort of, the industry has just changed so much now to what it was then. When I was working back in radio in 2005, we had, uh, in our radio station, we had a staff of about, probably about 25 to 30 people. And by the time it finished, they were down to three people. So it's all mechanization, you know? And the the main station, the main shows would be coming from Manchester, which were like I said, three hundred kilometers away. They would have out, they would out uh, outbreaks on the um, ads. They have local ads, but there was no local identity. Your local callers yeah. were not there. You know, it was just, and they called it progress, and I don't think it no. is. And it, you know, it was the death knell mm-hmm. of, of of British radio, and it's it's a generic sort of attitude that they've got across the board, and local radio just does not exist anymore in the UK, and it's really sad. It's really sad, yeah. especially for older people who really sort of listened in every day without, you know, getting another presenter said hear local accents. Yeah. And I, I just think it's really sad, you know. Not That's not, not everything in progress is good. No, not all progress yeah. is good. I don't no. think anyway. Yeah, yeah, radio and newspapers. Yeah, they're all kind of kind of going in the same Absolutely. way, same direction. And I was working as a freelance writer for a lot of uh, print publications. They all went with COVID and they haven't come back. And yeah. now it's working online, which is okay. It's a different medium, isn't it? You know, so. Um, but there's I a lot of people who do not do the technology. They don't get on a, older folks, the ones that actually want the paper in their hands. Yes. And like you said, you know? all the large print book, you know, which, which is brilliant. I did, I'm still thinking about that. You know, because older people, it's not that they can't, they just don't want to learn, do they? They don't, they're not interested in trying to fit around with a Kindle. We, okay, you get a percentage that right. do, but there's a large percentage that just think, oh, I can't be bothered. Oh, I, I, can't, I can't learn this. Yeah. You know? Or they just don't want to. They just don't want to. And and I'm that's okay. <laughs> you know, I'm just that's want to, you know, so it's okay. a smartphone. She's 88. If a mum were buying a smartphone, we can video call. No, I'm not having one of those. <laughs> and so, you know, my mother's my in the we didn't need them back in the day and I don't need them now. <laughs> no, we've, we've yeah. become a texting family and, uh, um, yeah, it's all it, because we're so spread out now. Um, my, uh, my, I have one brother and his family who live in Oklahoma and, uh, um, my uh, little sister and her family live in Indiana and, my parents and my youngest brother uh, live, uh, my youngest brother and his family, uh, they all live in Missouri. And it's just, you know, it's too, we're, we're too, we're too far afield to, uh, to not embrace some of this technology. Yeah. I mean, if it wasn't for, if it wasn't for podcasting, um, I wouldn't have the relationship I have with my father now, uh, which is great because it's twofold because not only do I get to interact with them, I get a record of those interactions. So at some point in the future, I'll be able to look back on them and go, wow, that was great. And uh, when, uh, when yeah. you know, that, uh, yeah. that time far, uh, far off when he's no longer available. <laughs> exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I, well, and I, never... there are certain aspects certain aspects of technology I it, I'm fascinated by and I think it's awesome like what mm-hmm. we're doing tonight there's three people from three different time zones in two different countries yeah. talking you know um and today my niece who is deployed in the military at an undisclosed location was able to FaceTime nice. us so there we were in my sister's dining room all super excited because we could see her yeah. face you know yes yeah. see her face and talk to her and she could see our faces being so far away from home, mm-hmm. you know? So that part of it, I love, I love, love that yeah. technology has taken us to that mm-hmm. point, but then it's also, you know, like, like with the newspapers we were talking about, there's um one recently, it was literally just two weeks ago, small town newspaper, 150 years, 150 years. Wow. And it had to shut wow. its doors. 
150 years. It was this town's local newspaper and it, it just had to shut their doors. And it, it literally the whole town is just devastated. They're heartbroken by it. I bet. 150 years and they had to, because they just couldn't maintain, yeah. they, they couldn't make any money. They couldn't afford to keep no. it open anymore. Newspapers, do they? They don't, they don't, they, did they not go online? I wonder, was that an option for them to do it online? No, they, well, my mom doesn't go online. I know that, my, <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah. know. <clears throat> it's strange enough. Strange like, enough. Uh, it's, they, they, what's happened here is that um, I had a meeting yesterday with a, a friend of mine, one of the editors, one of the magazines I write for, and the interior design magazine actually. And she is the only print publication left on this island. Wow. And she, she's wow. got a web page as well. But because of, she's the only print, it's actually in her favour. And she's, it's like a coffee table magazine. It's very, you know, it's very glossy mm. and very nicely finished. So actually, her sales have gone up. Because there's nobody else doing it, but she's one of the rare yeah. cases right. where you know this, right. this has happened because there's no competition from a print perspective. Even though people are saying print is dead, um, you, you know, in her case, it's actually worked to the to the to the opposite. But it's a, it's a bit of an anomaly in a way that you know it's a small island. You've got to remember that Malta is the size of Zurich. We've got a population here, mm. a, a resident population of five hundred thousand, half a million. Which then swells to well over a million in summer with all the, uh, well, we've got a lot of foreigners working here, of which I am one. Um, but they've also got a lot of tourists that come in here. But it's a small population, you know. Um, and so for her, for her sales to go up as radically as they have from her, it's been an unusual take on, mm -hmm. on progress. You know what I mean? It's yeah. sort of, it's, like I said, it's not an anomaly of a situation. The, um, the progress but it's definitely. I'm, I'm, yeah, you know, we we talked about we talked oh, about a little bit about the some of the progress not being great, you know, not being all that wonderful. But uh, um, but some of it some of it is, um, you know, there there's new opportunities yep. that open up. Um, I mean the uh, uh, you know the ability of people of the the now citizen journalists to uh, uh, to tell the story of whatever it is that's going on. I mean. Some of the stuff going on in places like you, you know, like Ukraine, we wouldn't know anything yeah. what was going on if it wasn't for right. these the, the citizen journalists, um, you know. But uh, um, yeah. you know, some things are lost. Um, you know, I, I think uh, I think there need to be more controls, more about uh, um, about what is it the the uh, the the ethics and and the fact checking and things like that that uh, that come along with uh, with with this type of journalism you know it's, it's just not as much there as it was when we had professional journalists uh, who were in the field and and uh, reporting from location um you know that right. uh, um, that we just don't have with uh with with the uh with the people who are reporting from the uh, from the ground now um so that that has some uh, some stuff to take. Uh, yeah, that has some stuff that needs to be taken care of for sure uh, before we uh, before we move on from the prof the era of the professional journalist. I think. Can I ask oh, you a I question? Though, sure. Honestly, do you do you really trust your news outlets to give you an unbiased? No. View? Because I don't. <laughs> no, I don't. And my son was a mm. ex-military and in intelligence. And the things that he's told me about news outlets, mm -hmm. you know, for example, Sky News, right. things like that, you know, they're not a real take on, I mean, whatever your politics are, for example, let's just take the situation right. with Trump, all right? I'm not going to touch on American politics. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not interested in it. I don't understand You're it. You're not the only one. But, you know, depending on the news, you know. Yeah, we don't either. Depending on the news <laughs> station, you know, the, the slant, okay, everybody, newspapers have their own slant. But I, like, for example, how true a situation is it? Because you've got, is there such a thing as an unbiased news outlet? Not entirely, no. Um, I mean, I, I tend to do a lot of radio yeah. news, um, but uh, um, uh, we got a we got a pretty reliable uh, uh, radio news station out here that uh, that I listen to when I'm in my car. Um, but uh, but no, you're you're right. I mean, it, it's. I mean, you've got your you've got your CNNs and MSNBCs, and you've got your 
Fox News and and uh, and so on 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 the other side, and it's like, yeah, what you know, it's like, do you listen to both so that you can fi- try to figure out what's going on in the middle? Oh, you know, you finishing out the truth. It it, re- it reminds me of. Uh, um, do you know the uh, the Adams family? Okay, Gomez <laughs> Adams um, wears a different uh, wears a wristwatch on his on each wrist. One is slow and the other is fast. And to know what time it is, he has to look at both and do the math. And yeah, okay. and so uh, so figuring out what's really going on in the world, in, in my mind, it, it has a parallel to that. It's like, I've got to watch the far right and the far left to figure out somewhere in the middle where the, uh, <laughs> where the, uh, where the actual news right. is. And that's how it feels sometimes. Yeah. And I also think I sometimes I'll just stay in my little bubble. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just stay in my bubble. You know what I mean? I do like, I mean, because I've got a journalistic background, I do very much like to know, I'm less so now, but I do like to know yeah. what's going on in the world. And the first thing I do in the morning is get my coffee on and I will go to the BBC, then I will go to Sky and I will check the various news sources and filter right. through it to try and get a real take on what's going on. Because that's something that I just yeah. like to do. Um, I read it, I don't watch it. And then that would take me about 15 minutes. And so that's part of my morning regime before I walk the dog. But um, like you said, it's trying to get that, you know, a totally unbiased take on what is really going on in this world. I mean, progress is definitely mm-hmm. a great thing. There's, there's no doubt about it. We've, and we've touched on some negatives at local radio. Or, like you said, without progress, we would not be sitting here having this conversation in right. three different time zones. I've got my daughter living in Sicily. We FaceTime. You know, I mean, it's, it's sometimes I forget that I haven't physically seen her for like three months, but that yeah. we're talking, you know what I mean? So there are so many, whereas before, you know, years ago, so they'd get on the banana boat and say, see ya, yes, me in three years' time. It's not like that anymore. <laughs> right. Things have changed. So there's a lot of positives, but it's just trying to, there's so much information. I, I read this really good analogy um, recently. When I, was, I got it when I was teaching, and it was saying that, you know, the average person in their lifetime, if say 100 years ago, the amount of information they would receive and collate in their minds would be the equivalent of one large thick newspaper mm-hmm. and that would be their entire life's news that they would receive you think how much we are exposed to mm-hmm. now how much we have at our fingertips oh, yeah. really isn't it we live in a completely different right. world. yeah it's you uh um, um what was that movie with uh tom hanks news of the world did uh did you uh ever see that one that was a look at uh at Okay, uh, it was definitely a, a period piece uh, looking at uh, the way the world looked at news uh, back uh, in the years after the Civil War. Um, and basically, Tom, Han- the, Tom Hanks' character, uh, his job was to collect newspaper clippings and read the news to people as a form of entertainment. Because they couldn't, I mean, many of them couldn't read and yeah, yeah. and some of them couldn't afford the newspaper anyway. And so they pay him a few cents to, to come in and listen to him uh, read the newspaper. And, uh, um, and I, I thought, what a world uh, to live in. But, I mean, we do that now. You know, it's like right. our, our newscasters, whether they be uh, print, radio, or, or television, you know, basically are reading the news to us. Um, you know, but with their particular slant to it, not just uh, not just saying this is the thing that happened. It's like this is what this means to you, and uh, and you should be scared of that. And uh, um, you know, because that's what a lot right. of that's what a lot of the yeah. news is uh, is is about now, because they want to scare you into watching more news, mm-hmm. so that they can sell more airtime. And uh, and do because it's all about commercials. Exactly. But yeah. I want to. I use COVID as mm-hmm. a perfect example. We were we were terrorized, yeah. you know, into this whole COVID thing. You know, I mean, and it, my local GP, my local doctor, went to see him the other day, and he was having a rant about COVID, just saying that it was all about basically mm-hmm. money making. It was about getting us to take vaccines. That you know that we didn't uh, not say we didn't need them, but the amount of money 
that was mm -hmm. spent on those, you know, the world came to, it, it brought the world yeah. to a standstill. Oh yeah, didn't it? it did. It did. Know? And uh, I mean, I had, I had my vaccines. I couldn't function without having had them. I still got COVID, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And, um, and it just, but how the world literally just came to a standstill over a, a virus. And, and, and every the vaccine thing is, the thing is, average of $25. How quickly it came to a standstill and how quickly people became mm. sheeple. Sheeple. Oh, I love that. Word. <laughs> That's brilliant, Kim. Yeah. Just believing everything that they were yeah. told. Yeah. And they let, and they let fear, all that fear that they were being told, you need to fear this. You need to mm -hmm. fear this. They just took it and I'm thinking, people, think. You can think for yourself. You don't need someone telling you what you should be fearing and what you shouldn't. And I'm not downplaying COVID. I know a lot of people who had it and I know several people who yeah. passed away from it. I'm not downplaying it. I just feel the way it was handled. No. It was handled yeah. poorly. And using and fear, fear, using fear Exactly. to stop a country and then you know the you whole know, thing do you do you remember do you remember bill here in the states at one point there was talk tossed about about having to have documentation that you were vaccinated mm -hmm. to just watch where are your papers right <laughs> And as soon as uh, the first time I heard that, I went, "Did we learn? Did we learn anything from the 1940s?" Of course not. You know, and and I just I was dumbfounded by that because it was literally on the television by our politicians, and I think a lot of people, at least in the U.S., they forgot that the government is by the people right. for the people. That's been completely pushed by the wayside. Well, it's because it's not of the people anymore. the The government isn't. Uh, right. Isn't, I just want to get along yeah. With it. Um, you know, the government's not made up of people anymore. Not of not of normal people anyway. Not of everyday people. Um, you know, it's the it's the people who nope. can raise the most money or spend the most of their own money. Um, you know, we just had uh, uh, elections out here in uh, well, not one of my elections, but, um, in, uh, LA. So not, you know, pretty much just down the street. Um, one of the, uh, one of the, the, one of the candidates, uh, spent like a hundred million dollars of his own money. He still lost, but <laughs> like, there was a moment there when he, when the guy who could have spent his own money, who spent his own money, you know, his own millions, could have been mayor of LA and uh, um, yeah, it, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. So he bought, so it effectively would have bought yeah, basically. the position. Which is what, you yeah. know, which is what anybody whether, does either, whether, either they whether, buy it for yeah. themselves or they, uh, or they have somebody buy it for them. Um, you know? Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and then they're yeah. beholden to the person who bought it for them. I mean, yeah, what you just, just said, you know, I've been so, so disappointed for quite a while now, the way that stuff is handled and done. And I'm, and like you said, Andrea, in a few minutes ago, you just like to stay in your bubble. That's what I like because to do. It. It's nice to be, you get the point. Sometimes you think, okay, I really want to be aware of what's mm -hmm. going on. But then when you really start to look at what really is going on and and, and how the depth, I mean, I've got a friend of mine, <laughs> That she she is what you call a conspiracy oh. theorist, okay? And I won't even touch on the, some of the stuff that she's <laughs> discovered, um, which is unbelievably <laughs> shocking. And, and in fact, it's so shocking that I've taken it into my book, because um, in the in the book they actually go into the future, and it, we call it, you call it the Illuminati, basically. But it, it's just unbelievable. And basically, I'm not going to rehash all that because it's far too complicated. But um, you know. Let's, if we just touch on COVID, that made the pharmaceutical companies and certain individuals mm -hmm. billions, billions. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
and 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 as you said, you know, having to have um, I took the vaccine. I didn't want the vaccine. I didn't want this foreign agent uh, injected into my body, but I had to because I couldn't travel. Mm. I couldn't travel. I couldn't function. I was made, you know. I know. I have people, friends, my friend included, is considered. She refused, and other people I know have refused to have the vaccines, and they now have a normal. You know, they they were like they were like uh, pariahs for like a, a year because they couldn't. You know, oh, you haven't been vaccinated. You can't go here. You can't go there. They couldn't travel, but actually now life is coming back to normal. But you know, was it Bill Gates that said? Um, he said this is just a precursor of of a much bigger virus that's going to hit us in about five or six mm. years time. And it's going to happen again. Oh, yeah. There's no doubt about it. It'll be something else, some sort of you know, so illness that that they will do the same thing again, and they will re raise billions yeah. again. Because um, mm -hmm. that's what this was, in my opinion. Yes, I'm not saying that COVID didn't exist. It did exist, and and people did die of it. But people did die of flu anyway. And they were the hospitals. I don't know what it's like in your country, but over here, people people are getting paid. Hospitals were getting paid to say that people died of COVID. The elderly people were dying when they would have died anyway, mm. and they would get paid like 40 or 50 euros uh, per person by saying that the death was from COVID. Mm. So I know it's, it's an old, you know, the old chestnut now and it's getting old, tired and old, you don't talk about COVID, but mm. it's indicative of, of the power of the media and how terrifying it is. And sometimes I just mm. think, well, I can't change it. I'm just staying mm. in my bubble. And I will definitely hoard, I will hoard toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember what happened? Oh, that reminds me. Do you remember what happened? I have to add that to the I have to add that to the shopping list. I will never, I will never understand the run on toilet paper. No. I did not understand that then and I no, still no. don't. It wasn't that kind of disease. Sheeple. <laughs> No, I know. It's like, why is everybody going crazy? It's like, you know, come on. You should be buying ginger ale and stuff like that and saltine crackers. There you go. You know? But instead, let's go, let's go buy all the toilet paper off the shelves of every store in America. Oh, oh it was crazy. I mean, it was the same. It was the same. <laughs> but, you know, it really goes to show, really, how fragile this world is that we live in. I think that one out. It is, you know, how fragile it all is, and that, and that we like to think, I and mean, it is, yeah, progress is great, but you know, it's a fragile mm -hmm. world. Well, I, mean, I had a, a phase about two years ago where I did it for a while. I lived off grid, and uh, it was a dream of mine. It was the hardest experience of my life actually doing it because I wasn't properly. I had, I had a, 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 I've got a barn, a barn conversion in Italy, apart from the property I have with my ex. And I wanted to take this place off grid, and but I, I put in um, uh, an installation which is the equivalent of an RV. It wasn't a proper house okay. installation. Good God, it was hard work. I can tell you. But what I what I realised was that if this actually stopped, you know, I thought this this place would like light itself. I'd have internet, whatever, you know, because who knows? Well, you know, that's what people if people really want to worry about the future, they should make themselves. Get dig that bunker, have that, you know, that that the supply, a year's supply of food and basic medicines, because that's that that's I know it's I'm not advocating that, but you know what I mean? It, our society is fragile. And 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 COVID and how that played out demonstrates that, in my view. Oh, you know, goodness, I have no doubt in our in our lifetime that that something else is going to come along. They've done it once, they've proven they can do it, and it's going to happen again. Oh, I'm very fine. positive to say that, sorry, but you know what I mean? But, yeah. You know, it's, yeah. It's scary. That's why it's I'm shocking. glad I can, you know, I, don't, I couldn't be self-sustaining, but I would be able to do okay. You know what I mean? I don't live off-grid, and I don't, I can't, I couldn't self-sustain, um, but that I could get by. But I mean, I don't live in a city. I don't live in an apartment in a, in a city. Mm -hmm. So there's millions and millions of people who would literally have no clue what to do because right. they think meat just comes from grocery stores. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They yeah, don't it think just it actually itself. comes from animals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they live on the farms that surround my house, you know? <laughs> Sounds ideal, yeah. though. Yeah, it's, sounds uh, lovely. I mean, I miss nature. 
I miss nature. That's why whenever I need that sort of, I'm feeling it now. I've been I was back from, I've been in Sicily three weeks ago and I'm already feeling the, the need to go and get sort of, because I'm, I'm up in the mountains there as well, 800 metres, you know, go and get a fix of the mountains and, and the, the valleys and things, you know, and, and just the farms and the simplicity of life because it's it's just, it really sort of, you know, recharges your batteries, mm -hmm. you know. Um, yes, but then, and then I miss the trees. The mania of Malta and the, and, the, and the craziness was everywhere. Everything's at a, at, at the fingertip touch, and everything's here. So the ideal world is to live between the two, and that's what I'm trying to do. But they're not. It's not. You know, it's not easy because um, you need money, a lot of money to build to live like that. And so, and I'm sort yeah. of like yeah. a little bit here, yeah, and then I shuffle over there for a while, and I'll shuffle back here for a while, and you know. <laughs> and so, but I can't complain. On the whole, my life is is quite good. I think I'm not complaining. I'm very excited about this having sort of like um, finished this second book, I don't it just sort of happened because I kept writing it every day. And then suddenly I thought, Craig, I finished it. And then I did it, I went through the word count yesterday, thinking that maybe I needed to make it a bit longer. And it's actually considerably longer than the first book. So in, in my sort of like meanderings, you know, from from um, of the last few months, I've actually sort of actually achieved something. But um, like I said, you know, the, but the, that's just tying that into sort of like, Sometimes life happens while you're while you're sort of busy making other plans, isn't it? You just tick along and you know just waiting for the next big crisis. <laughs> oh, how are you going to handle it when it hits next? Yeah. You know. So, right. Uh, well, that's what it is. Life's like a heartbeat, isn't it? I remember reading that, and I thought, you know, when 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 we're flatlining, that's when we're dead. It's it's all the ups and downs, basically. That uh, that you know. Yeah, that keep us here. Isn't it? Never knowing what's around the corner. Good days, bad days, problems, joyous moments. Yeah. You know, gosh, we've talked about everything, everything. in this in this um, interview. <laughs> <laughs> we put the words yeah, out. Uh, are we are we typical? That's... Are we typical guests? There is no such thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Um, okay. Yeah, because because uh, <laughs> yeah, the but... the the pairing is almost always random. Um, actually, that was what was funny was last week's show was the first show that was not technically random as far as the pairing goes. Um, I had, uh, um, because I was trying to change the recording schedule from evenings to mornings so that I could have the evenings free to meet with clients, um, um, we, uh, I found out that I had a guest with no partner. And so a single guest, and that doesn't does not a show make for this uh, for this particular format and, and uh, so I called up uh, I, I contacted uh, Mickey and uh, um, and said hey I've got a political guest on uh, coming up on the show and I'd love to find another political guest so we can have a big political conversation and uh, we ended up doing that and it worked really well but uh, I don't think I'd like to do that all the time um i like uh, i like the randomness yeah. of uh of just having two people that don't know they're getting paired up i don't know they're getting paired up i have no control over it um the way i've gotten it i've set it up and uh um and so there's no such thing as a typical guess um but uh, uh but sometimes the pairings just happen to be perfect and uh um, like tonight's was great mm -hmm. this was this was awesome well, Kim and I can certainly talk. Yeah. So that's for sure, isn't it, Kim? We're both, we're both good. Teachers. We've got stories to tell, you know. And we and we said we'd actually met. Yeah. The, uh, how long ago? About two yeah. months ago. Yeah. It was. Yeah, I think it was late summer. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I haven't finished. I have to go back and look. But yeah, yeah, we had a good conversation. <laughs> <laughs> that's why yeah. when I saw your name, I was like, wait a minute. That's I do know her. <laughs> it's just a pleasant surprise. <laughs> definitely definitely well i'll be talking to you again now when i get this book out next year because that's going into promotion i said october Absolutely, you know, yeah. so uh, uh, and yours and yours was published yesterday or today yeah. went online well still, technically still today for me it's eight minutes till midnight right now where i'm at so okay yeah today okay. yeah the ebook I, the ebook way and then the book when is the book actually coming out itself well, I just hit the publish button. So, oh, whenever okay. Amazon, whenever Amazon file, I, usually within a week. It's usually within a week. Oh. That they'll you manage all the technical sites. 
Huh? You manage all the technical stuff. You, you're quite good. You're quite savvy from a technical aspect. You can let me see that without that. It intimidates me. That's this why I've got book, the publisher doing it. This book, I it's the first time I've done everything on my own. So okay. it was kind of intimidating, but I wanted to give it a try. So no. I did it. Yay. I did it. <laughs> wow. Well Oh, so you're like self-taught then i mean i need to get a grip because i'm just too lazy i'm just like i just write it and then let them submit it and the editor comes back and she's brilliant you know and she's like no we need to talk about this we need to talk I mean, as much as i can do the spell check you know what i mean but that's just me being a bit dizzy well, i mean i have an really. editor i had i had a couple people proofread for me i do have an, an editor you know things like that i I, I I do have those people. I'm not doing all that you, on my own because I I, I don't, don't think you can. You, nobody can. No, no. that's just no. So no. I go through it. I read through all the stories, and I'll be like, I'll do a little like smidge of a de developmental mm -hmm. editing if needed, because some of the folks for the anthologies, because some of them have never written before. They have a phenomenal story to share. They've just never yeah. written, so they need a little mm -hmm. guidance, you know. Um, but yeah, I don't, I, all that, but the technical part, like getting the book formatted and the cover created and formatted and stuff like that, I pretty much taught myself and it, it, it is oh, time I consuming, know. but again, I like to stay busy. I, I like to learn new things and now I know I can do it. So it's hmm. kind of exciting. So I'm like, gosh, okay. Now that I know, how, and I have the templates and all kinds of stuff for everything, because as I was learning, I saved all that. So it's kind of, it's kind of fun. I, I'm, I'm a big one on uh, self-teaching or self-learning. I do a lot mm -hmm. of that and always have. That's good. I mean, and also the fact that you've written, um, it's not your first book, is it? You said you've written others as well. I mean, I, 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 we talked about this. I said that, you know, I worked as a features writer for like 25 years and then written hundreds of articles, but I don't know what took me so long to write a book. I think it's a different type of stamina mm -hmm. to write a book. Um, it is. I agree. It is. Yeah. And now I've done it. I, I understand and I don't get, I, for me, the trick was really to comp compartmentalize it, that's the word, you know, to, to break it up into seg segments because otherwise you can just think, and I've actually got this the second book, I put it into three parts um, because it was three specific stories um, and they are all got a completely different character because sometimes when you just look at it as a whole, it can be so intimidating mm -hmm. and and you just think, and you can get lost in it. I, I, are you one of these people that really plans things meticulously or do you just, just go with it and see where it takes you? I kind of just, I'm kind of like one of those people that just goes with it and see where it takes me. I'm the same. <laughs> so I've got a rough yeah. idea. And uh, yeah. and then the stories to go yeah, I'll have a rough notes. idea and I'll have, maybe I'll have some notes, but I've not done a novel. I, I'm more nonfiction. So I haven't, okay. done, I haven't done a novel. And that actually intimidates me, the thought of it doing and not having to do, you know, outline it and have characters and dialogue and all, all of this stuff that actually, it's kind of intimidating to me. Now I'm working on one quietly in the background that it's fiction, mm -hmm. but it's, it's a slow work in progress. And it's as I get more comfortable with it because mm -hmm. I already have characters and I know what their voices sound like. It's in my head already. They're already there. Yeah, yeah. They've come yeah. to me already. Um, they just haven't gotten loud enough for me to sit down and really focus on doing that whole book yet. So, I think I told um, you this. With, 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 I've got characters that I've taken from one book into another. One of the taxi driver in suspension, I've taken him into chemo club. He's completely fictional, and then I can see him. He looks like he looks like the husband or friend of mine. He's nothing like him in character, but he just looks like that. And I have to yeah. remind myself, this person isn't real. Yeah. You know, he's like an old, <laughs> yeah. he's like an old friend, you know. And um, and uh, yeah. I think that's what being writers. I think we we do sort of live in this partial sort of like quasi imaginary world. I know I do. Um, and I never thought yeah. sci-fi would be something I would write, but it just it just sort of happened. What about you, Bill? Have you ever written or have you ever thought I've about thought writing? about it, but I haven't. Well, I I did some writing when I was a kid, but nothing uh, nothing serious. Um, 
you know, uh, superhero stories and things like that. But uh, um, which I guess uh, would put me in vogue right now. But uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, um, but no, There's not just... uh, not really. I've done some. So I've done more nonfiction work, I think, than uh, um, than that. But uh, but I've never been published. So so there's there's that. Mm. Mm -hmm. Maybe one day. Well, there doesn't mean doesn't mean you're That's not true. Be. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's right. I remember I started um, suspension in 2015, and, then, and I, I've gone home to see my mum and dad. I'm driving under this great big bridge, the Clifton Suspension Bridge. Every time I drove home, it was a route home to drive under it, and just you know, being so mesmerised. There's got to be a story, you know. And then the story just came to me really quickly. And then I started writing it, thinking I'm not going to finish this. And I and I shelved it. And then I went back to it like after a year. And and then I, I, I had it there and I got sick and I had lots of time on my hands. And I just thought, well, let's just, and then I got a deal, but I had actually finished it. So and I, and I told a big fib, that's all I had. <laughs> so then I was like writing, you know, burning the midnight oil, trying to finish this thing. And so that's how that came about. But the second book has been a lot easier to write. Um, because I think you get more assured as you sort of like you, you do it one time you think oh well I can do yeah. it so yeah. and also you, you get and I was lucky to have a good very supportive editors as well that helped me and and whatever put up with my bad spelling and, and obviously there's a difference between American English and English English as well so yeah. and some yeah. of the phraseology is different you know so um, um spelling but yeah spelling of the same you know almost backwards almost backwards isn't it that's, that's that's the way forward yep. Goodness. How we do how we do um, for um... We we've almost gone a full two hours. Which is wow. uh which is okay. which is rare. I was thinking we'd be talking. Um <laughs> that's, that's, that's a, a long, long time. time to talk. That's a lot of talking. A lot of talking. I can honestly say I'm I can honestly say I'm starting to I'm I'm starting to get there myself. <laughs> I, I think I need a little coffee. Yeah. yeah. It's mid well, I... <laughs> Yeah. So after, especially after a Thanksgiving lunch, yep. Ooh. I can imagine. She's dinner, gotta get. She's gonna get lunch. I need. It's, it's yeah. midnight here. Oh, it's midnight. It's, oh, it's yeah, nine, nine o'clock here. here. Okay. Well, I'm. My, I'm just waking. It's two minutes past six in the morning here. So, <laughs> yeah, you're ready for breakfast. Like, yeah, I am. Take the dog for breakfast. Walk. That was like one of like. <laughs> so funny. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, I think we're calling. I think we're calling it a wrap. Yeah, let uh, let poor Kim uh, get off to bed. <laughs> I am, I'm all of a sudden just like I'm like, oh, I'm starting to yeah, lose yeah. <laughs> I've got to I've got to go clean up the Thanksgiving dinner. So uh, um. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Well, look, it's been great talking to you both. Lovely to see you again, Kim. It's really a pleasure, you know. Yeah, it was nice to see you again too. Yeah, it's been lovely. Yeah, sure. it, it, this it's been lovely, nice. been lovely seeing both of you, and uh, it's been a great conversation. Do you uh, fine ladies have anything else to say to the nice people? Hey, thanks, no. thanks for tuning in. If you're hanging out with us, you know, <laughs> thanks for tuning in, and I hope everybody in the states every actually had a nice yeah. Thanksgiving. So, you know, hey, Pennsylvania signing <laughs> off. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so very much. And this is Walter signing. All here. right. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, uh, thank you both for uh, for being on the show. It's been uh, it's been great. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Bill. You all have. Let's see, Angela, you have a Andrea. Oh wow, I must be tired. Andrea, you have a wonderful day. Kim, you have a good night. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. All Thank right. You, and everybody stay tuned for Have the ending day. credits. Enjoy your dinner. <laughs> you too. Take care. Good night. Good night. Thank you all for tuning in. This has been a presentation of Bald Spots Productions. I'd like to thank my producer, my beloved mother, Eileen Hatch. I, of course, am your humble host. I'd like to thank my special guests, Andrea Faye Christians and Kim Langling. Yay. Yay. If you feel so uh, so led, uh, please support the show over on Patreon.com. You can find us as Bald Spots Pro. That's uh, and don't you dare miss YWL Online. Normally on Tuesdays and Saturdays. You can find out more on Facebook and wherever fine podcasts are sold. 
Tune in next time for Jennifer Lieberman and Freddy Cruz. Going to be another interesting conversation. Please be sure to like, comment, share, stay informed. To stay informed, you know, subscribe, follow, whatever you got to do to kick that algorithm into gear so we can reach more people. Yay! <laughs> Thank you again for tuning in and have a wonderful whenever. What about